on table with a very pleasant event. Uh, this is a uh, awarding ceremony. I would like also uh, to um, congratulate all participants. Um, uh, this is the third um, day of the assembly. Uh, this is large scale event um, of the year in the medicine area. And um, uh, now, um, uh, within uh, two last days, um, um, more than 30 press conf press um, events uh, were conducted, more than 50 discussions and sessions, uh, uh, more than 30 exhibitions with achievements, uh, 100 master classes, uh, 360 journalists um, visit, visited this event, uh, and also we issued uh, more than 15,000 materials. Um, uh, and the 50,000 guests um, visited assembly only on the first day. Now um, let's um, proceed um, uh, to our important part. Um, uh, this assembly is open not only for specialists but for all uh, those um, who are interested in the issues of healthcare system. Uh, so our session is called um, uh, Clinical Pharmacology, Prospects um, and Possibilities. Uh, but first, uh, let's speak about the festival um, Formula of Life. It has been conducted since 2012. Um, it allows professionals uh, to share their experience uh, with each other to approve qualification. Uh, and also uh, to represent uh, uh, an image of real modern uh, uh, physician. Uh, those people uh, who, are, who dedicated their lives uh, to medicine are heroes, um, and we would like um, uh, to award them now. Uh, clinic clinicist, pharmacologist, uh, provisor and, pharma pharma and pharmacist. Uh, for awarding ceremony, I would like you to welcome uh, our moderator, uh, Deputy Head of Ministry of Healthcare Moscow, Yulia Julia Antipova, also um, a Doctor of Medicine Sciences, um, a Chief um, Specialist of um, a pharma a ph a Pharmacology Department in Moscow, Marina Zhuravlova, please uh, your applause. And before uh, awarding ceremony, I would like to give the floor uh, to you, Julia. Maybe you can say a few words to our audience and to us. I was preparing uh, for today um, because uh, uh, this is uh, a tremendous assembly which uh, we already have, among which we have already had. Uh, I'm lucky that I can. Uh, moderate this uh, round table dedicated to clinical pharmacology. Uh, we can uh, speak about the role of clinical pharmacologists, but you know about them a lot, uh, uh, especially um, in this uh, world uh, um, uh, which uh, changed so um, um, quickly. Uh, sometimes medications are very expensive. Uh, we also develop a lot of services for patients, but we just could uh, take paper and uh, say that clinical pharmacology uh, studies um, influence uh, of medications, uh, but all this assembly, um, uh, you know, uh, was practically all dedicated to digitalization and in pharmacological uh, uh, area digitalization is extremely important. Uh, are we now um, uh, having the pilot of uh, marking of medications? Uh, uh, the industry of healthcare is resource intense, um, and medication provision takes uh, the second resource uh, after human resource. Uh, that's why digitalization. Uh, and the possible services which help uh, uh, to provide for medications uh, are important. And your contribution uh, uh, cannot uh, be compared uh, to any other professions in this case. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, at the exhibition we have a, a very uh, crazy robot uh, which helps to sort out medications and uh, register medications. I, 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 uh, I felt I, as a kid uh, around, uh, so I like this robot very much. Maybe we also need uh, it. Um, it's uh, extremely essential what you do. I'm uh, glad uh, that the, there are so many people, uh, and uh, I uh, 
Uh, so maybe we can uh, proceed with award ceremony. Uh, Julia, okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's proceed. Uh, give a round of applause um, uh, to winners and specialists, uh, uh, clini clinicist, pharmacologist, uh, Filipova Olga. Uh, please, uh, Fili Olga, uh, come to the uh, tribune and uh, take an award. And here we have cameras. Uh, we congratulate you with this um, victory. If you want to say a few words, uh, you can do this right now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for this award, which uh, I received. Uh, and uh, I worked, uh, have worked, uh, have been working in the Moscow healthcare system more than for 50 years. Uh, for 50, well, already uh, during 15 years, I work uh, on medical provision in uh, outpatient clinics. Uh, thank you, Marina Vladimirovna, uh, that you joined us well. Uh, and now we uh, know uh, what clinical pharmacology is. Uh, and uh, uh, we also improved its level, um, and uh, uh, now it takes uh, the best place uh, in Russia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Olga. Uh, please uh, take your seat. Uh, now let's proceed. Uh, the other nomination, uh, this is um, Provisioner, and the Specialist of the Year in this nomination will uh, become uh, Novakova Olga. Uh, please come here to the stage. Good evening, Olga. We congratulate you once again. We wish you success. Uh, uh, thank you for your contribution to this uh, profession and to development of a uh, healthcare system in Russia. Uh, dear colleagues, um, uh, so today is uh, an important and interesting day. I would like to thank uh, organizers uh, of this uh, competition. Um, I would like to thank uh, Julia. We have been working um, with, her, with her for many years, Marina. I would like to thank um, also my uh, management for trust and support. Thank you, colleagues, um, who um, um, even on Saturday came here. Thank you. I congratulate you. Please um, uh, go uh, to the audience. And the third nomination, uh, a, phar a pharmacist, um, uh, the specialist of the year, uh, will be Slipuchina, uh, uh, Slipuchina Yelena. Please come uh, to the stage. Uh, now let's uh, make a general picture. That's uh, your victory. Uh, maybe also you can say a few words if you want to do this. I would like to thank everybody. I did not expect uh, uh, that uh, I that uh, I will have this honor. And also I thank uh, our organization. Uh, uh, the uh, pharmac ph ph um, pharmacies uh, of Moscow, of the capital, uh, and uh, I would like to thank also our team. Uh, thank you, Yelena. Now uh, let's uh, proceed to the official part. Uh, thank you, moderators. The session, um, uh, clinical um, pharmaceutical uh, uh, services of Moscow, and uh, possibilities and prospects. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I don't want um, uh, to call it a, an official part uh, because I hope this will be working uh, session. Uh, this is uh, the round table. You can ask questions if you want. Uh, and also, at present, uh, uh, clinical um, pharmacology uh, and uh, medications uh, now go to another level. And we are lucky uh, that together uh, we can participate in this and um, now uh, we can um, uh, go um, uh, we can accept our digital quanta so-called 
Uh, now I would like uh, to give the floor to Chief uh, Pharmacologist uh, of uh, Moscow Department, um, Mrs. Zhuravlyova. Uh, this is not a formal session. I agree with you. Now we can make conclusions and also uh, to to say that we have uh, we have had a lot of work during this year, and we can say that. Um, now uh, we have a good team of people who understand the importance um, and necessity of our um, specialty and uh, medical provision. Uh, we are lucky that uh, our uh, um, uh, coordinator, uh, Julia, uh, also um, wants um, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to manage uh, a medica a medication pharmacology. These are not only buying and selling drugs, uh, but also these are trainings, uh, digitalization, po uh, possible ways uh, to improve uh, the work of doctors. Because without medications, there is no treatment. Uh, uh, so uh, I, um, I am an engineer. Uh, this is my first background. This is my first education. That's why digi digitalization for me, it's um, a very understandable word. word. Thank you, dear colleagues. Uh, uh, today we have um, an intense uh, day after our congratulations, after our award ceremony. Uh, we can continue. Uh, and uh, we hope uh, that in the audience now we have those people uh, who in the future will also uh, uh, receive uh, such awards. Uh, so speaking about clinical pharmacology, uh, I can remember that um, uh, during the plenary session uh, there were discussions of our mayor and uh, also uh, the presenter uh, and also Veronika Skvartsova, our minister, about the role of uh, uh, medication therapy. And today, uh, Moscow for our uh, um, country is, um, you know, a trendsetter regarding medications. And of course, uh, we should uh, take advantage of this resource. Uh, um, uh, World Health Organization uh, refers medications uh, uh, to the most important factors uh, which define the health of nation and health um, of population. Uh, so, and thanks uh, to development of pharmacology and also uh, these uh, huge problems linked uh, with the first medications, uh, so-called uh, humanitarian disasters. Uh, uh, so um, this is um, um, also ended up uh, with the development of clinical pharmacology and uh, um, WHO defined our speciality as a speciality which can uh, exist separately and can be developed. Um, we have legal framework um, for today, quite a lot of it, and it's in compliance what we do now. Um, the part of the decrees uh, are compulsory, some part are recommendations, and also we have professional standards uh, of clinical uh, pharmacologists. Uh, the tasks uh, of this um, clinical pharmacologist uh, are always um, expanded uh, and the most complicated issues of uh, um, medication medical therapy uh, um, solved um, by several parties but also we have um, categorization we have also our responsibilities uh, treatment work uh, definition of uh, medical policy um, are not uh, desirable um, responses but also we have the, the decree um, from 2003 new functions were defined um, and uh, uh, this uh, is uh, uh, pharma uh, genetical studying of medications uh, monitoring and also antimicrobial medication research and also antibiotic resistance uh, without this um, it's impossible to continue our activities. And also we need uh, to involve our specialists uh, in this work. Um, we um, uh, sometimes um, we speak about uh, over-the-counter drugs and not uh, registered uh, drugs. Uh, how should we solve these issues uh, without uh, consolidation, without this uh, multi 
um, level uh, approach, we can't solve these issues. And we uh, also have some certain um, uh, legal acts. Um, we have the medical uh, help, um, and also uh, there are recommended uh, norms. Uh, one physician uh, for 250 beds uh, or for 500 visits uh, per shift. Uh, Moscow is doing, uh, is making steps um, in this direction um, uh, to, um, uh, you know, strengthen uh, a number of doctors um, in our multi-profile uh, hospitals. Um, sometimes we have. Um, 1.5 thousand beds uh, in these uh, hospitals. It's a unique situation. And um, now um, let's look at the uh, at this uh, uh, at this uh, depart at uh, this uh, division. Uh, it repeats um, Moscow layout. Um, and for today, in 85 percent of uh, um, large uh, hospitals, uh, we have uh, um, pharmacologists. Um, physician pharmacologist uh, uh, and uh, we also um, are busy with outpatient um, um, institution because outpatient um, uh, clinics uh, should also be uh, should also get involved in this structure we have 62 physicians um, uh, they work in Moscow and uh, this is a big service of pharmacology in Moscow. And uh, also this, um, uh, so uh, advanced technologies can be implemented uh, and uh, um, medical uh, therapy can be analyzed. The problems are linked with medications, especially now we speak about uh, pediatrics. Uh, today, uh, I think the other speakers will speak about it. Uh, what Moscow uh, is doing, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to to make this in compliance uh, with the um, legal framework. We have the big department uh, uh, which is busy with pharmaco supervision. We have many medications who, which are checked uh, and uh, doctors uh, are all are trained. Uh, uh, they have to assess uh, um, adverse um, uh, side effects uh, and also uh, some medications can be replaced by each other. When we speak about specialties of clinical pharmacology, uh, uh, even at the beginning it uh, stated that there are some special categories of patients and we should pay attention to them. Uh, these are children, uh, pregnant women, uh, patients um, uh, who uh, have uh, kidney failure, change of metabolism, and uh, uh, this uh, needs uh, highly qualified help uh, and also um, uh, clinic clinicist pharmacologist uh, to define uh, uh, proper medications um, and um, uh, the pediatrics um, area uh, this is uh, a special department this is not a small kid this is a person um, who is developing all the time his um, uh, organs uh, are changing um, and uh, they respond di differently uh, to medications uh, in our um, uh, team, uh, we combine, uh, um, uh, you know, different uh, types of doctors, um, and we pay, should pay even more attention to this, because, um, uh, you know, a lot depends on us uh, how these uh, children will um, live. And of course, we have to say that a particular role belongs to the obstetrician and gynecological assistants and uh, pharmacologists help in uh, perinatal centers and during labor to select the pharmacotherapy for the most difficult patients. These are women who before did not have the possibility of remaining healthy. Speaking about medicines, I urge you to imagine how difficult it is since there is no evidence base that would regulate and say that a certain medicine is absolutely safe for pregnant women. So that's the area of risk and responsibility. And we have to determine the range of medicines for a particular woman, and that will determine her fate as well as that of her baby. 
Another category of patients that is important to us is elderly people older than 65 years of age, specifically patients older than 85 years of age. Today we have a specific goal, reaching the age of 85, dancing, being active, so not just surviving until this age, but remaining socially active, continue working. So the program that was implemented several years ago in the Moscow healthcare is uh, taking care of elderly patients with comorbidities. Here you can see the leading conditions such as arterial hypertension, ischemic heart disease, cerebrovascular disease, uh, chronic heart failure. These are the most acute conditions because uh, uh, when we have uh, patients after stroke, stenting, we need to be very good in taking care of them. Otherwise, many of them may find themselves in a group of patients with chronic heart uh, insufficiency. Then, fibrillation. Today, we established that there will be a cohort of patients receiving anticoagulants and uh, cholesterol regulating drugs. This is a unique system that was first announced by Moscow and we shouldn't forget that uh, after the cardiovascular diseases come respiratory diseases. This is particularly relevant uh, during the uh, flu and uh, respiratory infections period. There, are all, there is also the challenge of uh, nosocomial pneumonia that requires antibiotics for treatment. Clinical pharmacologists draw the attention of all the doctors to the fact that elderly patients have a number of particularities. This is uh, what we call fragile patient. These are patients with chronic pains, and there, is num there are a number of drugs that are not to be used in those patients, but still we need to treat them. There is also dementia, depression, and anxiety, and uh, dementia often comes on the first stage, and without treating de dementia, we will not achieve a lot in treating other morbidities. Here is where pharmacologists should play a role. Sometimes uh, patients receive uh, an oral anticoagulant and uh, an anti-inflammatory, which is a red flag for us, actually. Speaking about clinical pharmacology, if we were um, among doctors, doctors would say that uh, antibiotics and antifungal uh, are the prerogative of clinical pharmacologists. Because indeed, clinical pharmacologists have uh, a very wide overview of um, various medicines to treat such conditions. If we see this profile, we will see that more than 50% of patients get empirical treatment. So the uh, doctor needs to have the algorithm of decision making before getting the test results and sometimes even not having any other specific indicators. So this, this can be done right only in case of constant monitoring of the situation. We have been telling you about various programs that we see. In particular, clinical pharmacologists are the first here. But the main question that we need to find an answer to is uh, does this patient require antibiotics or not? At our assembly, there is a line of people going to otolaryngologists. This is the most widespread pathology. It is actually even easier to prescribe an antibiotic than 
not to prescribe it and explain it. So in that respect, we have a very important decision of our government about the strategy of preventing antimicrobial resistance spread dated 25th of September 2017. According to this decree, everyone should tr address antimicrobial resistance and uh, make campaigns there. Moscow is a leader in terms of this strategy and at many forums people tell us thank you for having brought together the country within this program because uh, other regions were looking at Moscow and they started to implement those programs as well. We are planning to go from hospital treatment to outpatient treatment more and then the antibiotics will play a crucial role as well. Here you can see the algorithm of every patient entering into antibiotic treatment regimen. So at the first stage a patient comes and medical history is collected at stage two, phenotype is determined at stage three the uh, medicine is prescribed. That is how we are working now and here are the profiles um, of patients described. From this year we have been conducting a study on gram-negative resistant flora. I am mostly speaking about nosocomial infections and polyresistance as well as panoresistance. But still we help and we give a chance to patients to survive in case of this pathology. Without the registry we will not be able to see the full picture of Moscow and take a correct decision. So multidisciplinary approach is crucial here. Today already 34 hospitals have been included in this register. The others are preparing to join it. So in a couple of years we will get some results that will probably allow us to change the prescriptions. We cannot imagine a clinical pharmacologist without pharmacists, senior pharmacists, clinicists. And today a big role belongs, of course, to our pharmacy chains. So good pharmaceutical counseling is crucial in decision making. It also allows to minimize self-treatment. It allows to regulate uh, the OTC drug use. And of course it's important to collaborate and it's important to ensure professional continuity so that the patient gets the same recommendations and prescriptions. Speaking about the future, we would like to merge the efforts of all who deal with medical treatment. We should, of course, continue including patient in this chain and remember that we do all of that for the sake of the patient. Of course, the new technologies and uh, medical decision assistance system is something that will allow to rationalize treatment. We live in one of the best healthcare systems in the world and our Moscow healthcare system gives us huge opportunities. We would like to see once again that clinical pharmacology is always ready to use all the best available technologies to develop science and bringing together our knowledge and efforts we will be able to achieve rational use of drugs. Because no matter how good the medicines are, only a good expert taking into account all the particularities will be able to achieve positive results. Congratulations uh, upon this amazing assembly and I hope that it will be very positive and useful for every one of you. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Marina. This morning we had a very interesting session about voluntary certification of the quality of medical organizations. And uh, on one of the slides, it was shown that nearly 40% of medical organizations will not be able to undergo such a certification regarding the safety of using drugs. This confirms once again how important clinical pharmacologists are and uh, that we need to further develop this. Certification is not licensing. Licensing is different. Voluntary certification is uh, being ready to implement that. And I'd like to give the floor to Associate Professor of uh, Dear colleagues, we will soon get my presentation. While the presentation is being downloaded, I have a question. Many people have been speaking about um, digitalization and package uh, prescriptions. How do you think? Is it good or bad? Or is it uh, something that uh, we will not be able to get rid of later? Of course it is good. And in my presentation I will show how much information needs to be taken into account by clinical pharmacologist and the doctor. So digitalization of healthcare is of course something good because it is necessary to introduce uh, decision-making support systems as well as instruments of, instruments of fighting polypragmatia or polypharmacy. Speaking about polypharmacy, we face a number of challenges. Uh, this is the challenge of identifying it, uh, treating it, and fighting it. In scientific literature, you may see up to 24 various definitions of polypharmacy, but in clinical research, what is used more often is quantitative um, definitions of polypharmacy, prescribing five or six um, medicines to the patient at the same time. In spite of the fact that uh, there is this quantitative definition of polypharmacy, clinicists prefer quality-based uh, definition of polypharmacy. It is just prescribing more medicine than needed by situation or just unjustified prescription. Polypharmacy can be uh, divided into two areas. First, rational or justified polypharmacy when the patient has several comorbidities uh, and according to clinic clinical recommendations we need to prescribe several drugs and contra indications and uh, interaction between medicines needs to be taken into account. But there are also cases of irrational or unjustified polypharmacy when there is not enough scientific evidence for prescribing such medicines. And we are going to continue speaking about that. What's the danger of polypharmacy? First of all, it's uh, the non-efficiency of treatment and side effects, which will increase costs on treatment. Here you can see the Garantonet scale, the scale of assessing adverse events in elderly people. You can see that polypharmacy is a big factor for side effects and the use of eight and more medicines will increase the risk of um, side effects uh, and adverse events twofold. The number of medicines used at the same time also correlates with increase in mortality. For example, in case of 10 medicines, um, uh, the risk of death increases twofold to compare with patients who don't take any drugs. What are the patients that may suffer from polypharmacy? First of all, elderly people, especially those older than 85 years of age, and uh, also babies and children. And another important factor is multimorbidity. So having many diseases, each of which requires its own medicines. All the methods of addressing that may be 
divided into the analysis of each prescription, optimizing pharmacotherapy, and uh, also the third method is uh, the deprescribing algorithm. Here we can see the so-called uh, index of rationality or medication appropriateness index. Here we can see a questionnaire uh, and uh, the doctor answers the uh, questions uh, and as a result the doctor may range all the medicines in terms of their appropriateness. There are some more appropriate ones and less appropriate ones. This is uh, basically the only quantitative criterion of evaluating the appropriateness of prescribing medicines and uh, the analysis of every medicine takes 10 minutes. So if there are six uh, medicines, it takes 60 minutes. It's not uh, that therefore appropriate for routine practice. There is also another approach of uh, Israeli doctors. It is palliative, palliative approach to addressing polypharmacy in elderly patients. Uh, they suggest uh, some options of cancelling some medicines, replacing them, reducing dosage, and so on. This method uh, was uh, tested on 120 patients, uh, and uh, th this approach was not accompanied by adverse events and uh, uh, reduction of mortality in the main group uh, was achieved. Speaking about um, Um, Non-recommended drugs, of course, we have to mention beers criteria. Uh, they are reviewed from time to time. The last edition dates in 2019. These criteria are presented in the form of tables. <coughs> there are some medicines we avoided in all elderly patients. There are medicines to be avoided in elderly patients with some symptoms and uh, um, medicines that could be used but with caution. Here uh, we have um, an example of Beer's criteria. It is um, inappropriate to use uh, non-steroid anti-inflammatory drugs because there is an increase of risk of uh, uh, gastrointestinal bleeding and uh, the alternative would be used to uh, use would be to use them together with the proton pump inhibitors uh, there are some restrictions um, uh, so uh, stop um, uh, criteria screening tool of all the all the people's uh, prescriptions uh, this is screening instrument uh, uh, of medications uh, for elderly people for example after infection uh, myocard uh, we don't have um, uh, acyl salicyl acid uh, for example uh, any medication without evidence uh, or um, application of inhibitors um, uh, or uh, blockade blockaders uh, uh, with patient with patients uh, for patients um, uh, and uh, also we developed such a tool uh, uh, for P pediatric omission of prescriptions and inappropriate prescriptions uh, for example um, application of uh, um, so a rect rectum application um, of paracetamol this is not this is not rational uh, it's uh, irrational um, uh, to um, uh, use uh, uh, two alternative medications and also the process of deprescribing uh, this is uh, 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 you know the abandonment of medication uh, uh, decline um, uh, of uh, medications um, uh, first, uh, safety intervention, uh, it leads uh, uh, to a uh, less amount of prescriptions and it's proved uh, that uh, deprescribing um, uh, also lowers uh, frequency of uh, prescriptions. Uh, in Canada, uh, there is a scientific uh, network on deprescribing. Uh, specialists, uh, they develop algorithms, so will have uh, uh, also inhibitors of proton uh, um, uh, pumps and uh, uh, here as an example you can see uh, uh, benzo uh, there is a pin uh, deprescribing uh, 
And in case um, if um, this benzodiazepine are um, applied for patients with insomnia uh, and patients above 65 uh, uh, is recommended to use it, but this is not uh, just elimination of prescription. Uh, but uh, I hear uh, this, um, uh, you know, elimination of prescription um, uh, is happening in accordance with the appropriate scheme. Also, monitoring plan um, and um, what it, it is needed to do if there are uh, symptoms of um, abandonment. And also, uh, so. Uh, um, palliative care uh, for on, um, oncolo oncolo oncological patients uh, with expected life uh, um, uh, duration six months. Uh, uh, we can here cancel some groups uh, of medications without uh, um, um, influence uh, on life expectancy. For example, all statins uh, we can um, cancel or acetyl salicyl acid. Uh, for primary uh, uh, prevention. Uh, also, uh, this guideline uh, is quite interesting. It was um, uh, created by the uh, Scotland uh, Department of the National Institute of Great Britain, a realistic uh, prescription um, uh, of, of uh, medications. This is patient uh, um, focused uh, approach. Uh, the first step uh, uh, definition uh, of therapeutic uh, goals, uh, what is important for patients. Uh, the second stage uh, uh, defining of those uh, medications uh, which are uh, should be used uh, for these goals, um, some replacement um, uh, therapies, uh, uh, also uh, the third step uh, definition of non obligatory. Medications, um, are those medications which have um, doubtful efficacy, uh, or as, as an example, um, uh, anticoagulants um, uh, with uh, um, uh, you know a thrombosis of deep veins, um, and um, three months uh, passed, uh, uh, but patients continue uh, to use this medication. The fourth step, a definition uh, whether we need uh, to add some uh, medications uh, to achieve therapeutic goals. And uh, the fifth step, uh, evaluation of safety of this uh, therapy. Uh, maybe there is uh, some uh, inter-medication influence, uh, uh, six uh, uh, feasibility, evaluation of feasibility, and also detection of those, uh, um, you know, uh, prescriptions which can be replaced by less expensive. And the seventh uh, step, which uh, sometimes uh, uh, is skipped by our doctors, whether a patients uh, can uh, uh, fulfill other prescriptions, uh, for example. Whether a patient is in compliance. As a conclusion, I can say uh, that uh, um, polypragmasy um, is uh, important uh, and uh, very often now we face this problem because uh, we have a lot of elderly patients. Polypragmasy leads um, uh, to adverse effects uh, and uh, you can see how many methods we developed uh, scientifically approved, but we don't know how to implement them in practice. Here we have to develop a medical pharmaceutical uh, innovative systems implement these measures in the process uh, of uh, prescription and physicians uh, uh, could should be informed uh, that patients uh, have uh, some criteria and also uh, maybe refusals uh, from this uh, medication. Now, Wachel, our founder of clinical pharmacology, says less medications, only necessary medications. And at our faculty, we developed a book, um, published a book. You can download this um, freely and uh, you can see how we can fight polypragmasy. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe then you can share uh, your presentation with us um, because uh, you spoke so many about so many interesting things uh, and, um, and now um, maybe also here we have to uh, concede uh, 
uh, patient himself because sometimes patients uh, themselves can uh, prescribe medications uh, for themselves. Um, yes, and also there is such a tool which is named uh, medication reconciliation uh, when um, a, a physician um, uh, has to fill in a list uh, of uh, medications patient always um, consumes um, and when there is a risk uh, that some medications will be forgotten uh, for example if uh, we discharge patients from hospital there should be the process of reconciliation Thank you very much. Now I would like to give the floor to Olga Mikova, Deputy Director of um, um, Medical um, Center. Uh, these uh, people, um, you know, help uh, patients in pharmacies uh, uh, to get um, medications and to explain uh, that not always uh, are different uh, train marks uh, mean different medications. Thank you very much. I will start um, because, again, we know that we don't have a lot of time. Uh, uh, so um, uh, the story of medication uh, prescription uh, has a long uh, story. These are also monasteries uh, of med medieval uh, Europe uh, and so on and uh, pharmacies in Russia, um, but um, in the middle of the 20th century uh, there was a boom of industry and individual uh, preparation in pharmacies was pushed away because uh, there was uh, these capacities uh, to produce, uh, uh, to produce uh, medications uh, through conveyors. Uh, at factories. But at the beginning of the new century, we again um, come back to personalized um, approach uh, towards patients and also large uh, pharmaceutical companies. <coughs> uh, and pharmacist um, comes uh, from a Greek pharmacos um, preparing cooking uh, herbs uh, and medical uh, medical uh, sense uh, genetics um, area started to develop uh, many companies started to use uh, a very different approach um, regarding uh, even uh, uh, preparation uh, uh, medications at the, at the factory, for example, um, uh, genome mapping uh, Yeseptin uh, medication, which was created uh, to uh, treat breast cancer, also was uh, uh, created uh, with the use of this technology. Now we know that there are many medications, but not always um, uh, they are of good use. Uh, uh, also, um, American pharmacogenetic Allen uh, Roses uh, uh, said uh, in the middle of the 20th century that uh, some medications um, uh, don't um, help everybody. Let's look at the individual approach in, in, the, in the pharmacies. Uh, uh, this is, uh, 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 you know, old people and uh, also what's linked with our children. Uh, this is uh, uh, the, mo uh, the, the biggest problem, because in development um, of these uh, events, uh, development of uh, our children's healthcare system, uh, it was said about um, improving uh, of medical um, uh, care organization, especially for infants. Uh, uh, there are no um, factory dosages. So let, uh, look, any, uh, look at any leaflet. Uh, so you. Uh, for example, even let's take the example Octopril uh, as the smallest dosage, 12.5 uh, milligrams. Uh, uh, so if you if you want um, uh, to accumulate the dosage for a kid, we need to uh, do this carefully. It's impossible. Uh, if um, even we split a tablet um, into four parts, nobody can guarantee uh, equal distribution of um, agent. Uh, this is our statistics within next within last years. You can see that in our pharmacies, uh, extemporal, um, extempora from Latin, um, when it's needed. So we understand uh, that this is uh, only one. Now we can consider individual dosages. Um, 
and uh, we um, can prescribe a particular medication. We can see 14 percent. Uh, these are infant, infants um, till one year. They don't have any ready medications. Um, uh, three years and uh, adults, adolescents. And now let's look at this slide. Um, here you can see that 60 uh, percent uh, are socially vulnerable. Uh, people, uh, elderly people and uh, children. Uh, and uh, now pay attention to this. Uh, we uh, take uh, clean agent uh, uh, and uh, in, um, in different uh, volume it can be uh, sugar or, or milk sugar, liquid forms, uh, this can be extras, distilled water uh, or some extracts where only natural ingredients are used. And on this slide uh, you can see uh, the um, explanation of the assortment. And this natural forms um, which are used uh, um, in, a, uh, so in natural way, uh, these are uh, cacao oil um, and um, uh, lanolin, uh, water-free lanolin, um, fatty vegetable oils, olive, sunflower and so on. So through lipid barrier it's possible to do this. Once again here pay attention that uh, mostly maximum safe uh, natural ingredients are used. And of course um, now we can't but uh, say uh, about quality control of these products which we produce. And uh, in our um, uh, so on the 15th of January, um, uh, our president paid attention uh, to uh, quality control system provision at all stages of uh, medical circulation and including pharmacies. In our medication, in our network, we have test lab, which is certified at the federal level. Uh, which uh, has all uh, uh, technical qualification possibility on quality control of medications and also those which we uh, manufacture. Uh, the, labs, um, uh, the lab was created in autumn, 40, the 41st. Uh, it is still preserved. We have uh, full control at all stages uh, of manufacture. Uh, this is uh, incoming control. We control all substances which we receive and also control in uh, pharmacies at the level of provision analyst and also the world uh, giants like Pfizer, they ever use this, Bayer and others uh, and all our medications are checked. Uh, and also randomly others and our lab uh, also take away some medications uh, prepared by our pharmacies and also uh, fulfill control quality control uh, and uh, also in the functions of our pharmacies uh, uh, we have um, also licenses uh, and also uh, we have all uh, possibilities and uh, our highly qualified uh, personnel can prepare medications for children, also narcotic uh, and uh, other. I would like also to draw your attention to the substances, rare substances uh, which we use uh, uh, for preparation, uh, which are in demand in pediatrics. It's a wide um, assortment. Uh, these are not tablets. Uh, these are clean substances which are registered uh, as medications. Uh, you can see them all, especially uh, Seldonafil, Viagra, and uh, also expected uh, prednisolone substance, Prosimit, um, which is also widely used um, in our practice. Uh, and also um, availability of our help. Um, we have 79 pharmacies, um, more than 80 uh, 
points um, where our population um, can uh, buy uh, medications uh, um, because all our pharmacies uh, accept these recipes and uh, patient um, also can come um, and uh, receive uh, uh, he, this uh, medication. Uh, since um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the middle of this year, we are in such a program. Uh, this uh, we accept recipes online, and uh, uh, this is in our. Uh, uh, so this is included in our digitalization program. A person can go, can um, choose um, a section, uh, some um, section. He doesn't come to the uh, pharmacy twice, uh, and uh, then um, the medication will be prepared, uh, and he just comes to take it. On the scheme, you can see that we started from 150 recipes, and in December, a number of these recipes reached already quite um, a big figure. 75% uh, of these recipes uh, are for children, because children are uh, in demand, also young people. Uh, young parents, they are more advanced. Um, and also look uh, at the geography, locations of this recipe. 69% uh, Moscow, Moscow region, other cities. So uh, we already um, started from Kaliningrad um, and went to the Urals. Russia and uh, the former Soviet republics, uh, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Ukraine, Moldova, and we have some uh, two other recipes from the Western Europe. This is uh, Germany and Italy, which also apply to us, uh, and uh, they also want us uh, to pr produce uh, these medications. Uh, I want to say once again uh, that we work uh, that we expand our services, uh, we uh, perform quality control uh, and also medical help. Because uh, here we need our investment uh, uh, and uh, medical service um, uh, to Moscovites. I would like also to thank Mo Moscow uh, uh, government, uh, Moscow department, because uh, they always um, monitor the you know, preservation of the social function and they always supported us in its development. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Olga. Yes, we can clearly see the increase of demand on these uh, dosage form and we also see the change of the user demand um, on the cosmetics. By the way, uh, I know that uh, uh, my friends were looking for flu powder in your pharmacy. Well, you could have uh, ordered it online actually. Well. It's always better to go somewhere and see everything with your own eyes. I would just like to make a small comment about uh, pharmaceutical cosmetics or, or medicinal cosmetics, since all the ingredients are registered as medicines. We are producing only legal things and uh, using only the allowed ingredients. Often people are asking us why your products uh, don't smell so well. I would like to draw your attention once again. You have probably heard that many complaints that uh, perfume produced 20 or 30 years ago have a different smell to compare with today. Uh, in the world, it is now prohibited to use natural ingredients that were used before, such as amber, musk. Now only synthetic analogies are used, and in our products we are not using any synthetics. And even the um, essential oils that we are using for good smell are also registered as uh, substances that can be used in medicine. Thank you very much. And I would now like to give the floor to Boris Rodionov, clinical pharmacist, head of the Department of Clinical Pharmacology of Hospital 52. 
Good evening, dear colleagues. Actually, my name is um, Sergey Andreev. I'm clinical pharmacologist of the City Hospital 52. Boris uh, wasn't able to come. I'm sorry. Uh, it wasn't announced to me. The subject of uh, my presentation will continue on the subject uh, of mar Marina, and uh, it is uh, dedicated to the work that takes a lot of time of clinical pharmacologists who work in hospitals. It is fighting infections caused by polyresistant pathogens. These uh, pathogens uh, that cause problems, according to WHO and the scientific communities, in particular in Russia, include, first of all, polyresistant gram-negative bacteria, enterobacteries, non-fermenting bacteria, methicillin resistant staphylococcus, vancomycin resistant enterococci and clostridium difficile. The issue of resistance to antibiotics is uh, being addressed not just by the medical community but also by economists. Since according to forecasts in the next 30 years mortality related to polyresistant infections will be higher than mortality from cancers. It is related to the spread of resistance and uh, the absence of new medicines with new m mechanisms of action over bacteria. In particular, over the last five years, around five medicines were issued on the market. These are new class antibiotics and not all of them are drugs uh, that would be able to fight polyresistant uh, hospital infections. Part of them are going to address non-hospital infections. Based on the results of epidemiological studies carried out in Russia, almost two-thirds are represented by infections of respiratory ways and uh, urinary system. Others affect other body organs. The leading hospital pathogen is uh, Klebsiella pneumonia, member of uh, interlateralis family. It is resistant to beta lactamase of white spectrum and carbapenemase. A huge role is also played by Pseudomonas aeruginosa. There are also gram positive bacteria such as methicillin resistant staphylococcus and vancomycin resistant enterococcus, and uh, their share declined. The gravity of the state of the patients. In ICU explains the high need and high frequency of using carbapenems, which in its turn leads to the increase in resistance to carbapenems. This was also shown by the marathon study. This study shows a catastrophic increase in pathogens resistant to cephalosporins uh, and uh, the resistance of uh, hospital gram-negative pathogens. Genetic typing of uh, pathogens also shows that leading pathogen is Klebsiella pneumonia resistant to carbapenem E. coli is also widespread. We identify more and more often metallop 
Betalactamasis, in particular New Delhi, Metallabetalactamasa. It uh, creates a lot of concern. We see at the same time the products of two beta lactamases, uh, Oxa 48 and New Delhi Metalla beta lactamase. In contrast to Europe, the prevalence of identifying KBC, carbapenemas, is quite low in the Moscow region and in large cities of Russia. For three years already, we have been conducting a research targeting the study of uh, CV infections caused by polyresistant gram-negative pathogens. They are accompanied by, by bacteremia. We identify the pathogen resistant to at least three antibiotics, including uh, three and four generation of cephalosporins and extremely resistant bugs that are resistant to most of the studied medicines and often they are sensitive to only one or two classes of antibiotics. In the structure of bacteremia we see quite a stable breakdown of uh, gram-positive and gram-negative pathogens. A bit more than half are gram-negative pathogens, but we witness an increase of resistant uh, gram-positive uh, pathogens as well. Over the last three years, the resistance has increased the frequency of uh, identifying bugs resistant to carbapenem increased by almost 50 percent from 76 to 112. These are uh, there is also bacteremia with the pathogens resistant to cephalosporin generation 3 and 4. These are Ishikiria coli it is most probably um, related to the spread of uh, gram-negative uh, pathogens outside hospitals. The frequency of Klebsiella pneumonia decreased somewhat. As uh, I have mentioned, the prevailing entry of infection are urinary ways. In particular, there are infections uh, um, that occur when providing medical assistance or in hospital. At a high level, we see neutropenic fever and pneumonia. Then, extremely resistant gram-negative bacteria. Almost three-fourths of uh, severe infections accompanied by bacteremia are caused by Klebsiella pneumonia. There have been quite a lot of infections created by, caused by E.C. Bomani and uh, P.S. Eruginosa. The main point of entry of infection are respiratory ways, uh, and there are a lot of uh, lung ventilation related pneumonia. In this case, the infection is co caused by XDR pathogen. We have done genotyping of beta-lactamase that was identified in patients treated in hospital. Among 11 stems uh, of uh, Klebsiella pneumonia, there were five OXA-47, three NDM, and three OXA-48 plus NDM. And we were particularly concerned by uh, the fact that we witnessed uh, NDM and OXA-48 at the same time. As for P.S. Eruginosa, 
most were resistant to carbapenem through other mechanisms uh, than production of carbapenemase. We see high mortality rates in patients with severe infections caused by polyresistant pathogens. Over the last few years, uh, we managed to reduce the mortality of uh, bacteremia caused by XDR, but uh, the cost was quite high. There was an impact on the budget and the length of hospitalization to compare the, with the medium length of six days. The patients uh, with infections caused by polyresistant gram-negative pathogens increased this number of days. The leading hospital pathogens are Klebsiella pneumonia and Acinetobacter baumani. They cause infections in patients with Im immunosuppression of various kinds uh, related to cancer, to blood, cancer, first of all, the immunity can also be suppressed by medicines uh, uh, or immunosuppression related to critical condition. The main factors of risk were identified in patients. First, use of carbapenems, cephalosporins of third generation and uh, aminoglycosides, uh, then uh, uh, staying in hospital for a long time, contact with uh, units with uh, a lot of polyresistant gram-negative uh, pathogens, first of all ICU and onco-hematology departments. Ways of fighting polyresistant bugs. First, reducing the use of uh, medicines with uh, most risk. First of all, cephalosporins of third generation and fluoroquinolones. They should probably be replaced by penicillins. thanks to which we will be able to implement the carbapenem saving technology, reducing the use of carbapenems in ICU or oncohematology allows to slow down the spread of polyresistant gram-negative infections. This corresponds to the concept of accompanying Damage. You can see here cephalosporins 3 and fluoroquinolones that are most uh, inadvantageous uh, in terms of its impact on the environment of the hospital. Another method of reducing the use of carbapenems without worsening the patient outcomes is uh, objectivation of. Uh, indications uh, in uh, patients with severe infections and indices of sepsis. We should use Temporello scale. If the severity is more than three, we choose carbapenems, maybe accompanied by aminoglycosides or fluoroquinolones. In case uh, of Temporello score less, then three, we may consider others, other drugs. Another method is to optimize the use of antibiotics to address uh, polyresistant gram-negative infections, taking into account the pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics of drugs, in particular, long infusion of beta-lactams, and uh, therapeutical drug man monitoring in aminoglycosides and glucopeptides. The use of continuous beta-lactam infusion with the use of low dose allows to overcome increased MPK of uh, 
pathogens without using high off-label doses. Using the knowledge of parameters of pharmacokinetics of medicines. The another possibility is to change the formulary of uh, antibiotics, including their medicines against uh, most widespread pathogens. Recently, we included their ceftazidim avibactam, and often also polymyxins are used. Now, the risk and tactics uh, when treating infections caused by multi-resistant uh, pathogen. These um, strategies has been proposed by Bassetti et al. There is some clinical practice of those in cholestine. As of today, cholestine is not registered for intravenous administration in Russia. We are using polymyxin B to treat polyresistant gram-negative bacteria. We are using the low dose and uh, supporting those independently on the kidney function, independently on the reduction of kidney function or the use of uh, uh, kidney replacing therapy in spite of uh, uh, additional risk for the patient's kidneys in case of septus. Unfortunately, polymyxin has uh, increased nephrotoxicity and it occurs uh, more often than when using low doses. However, polymyxin is the last resort treatment. Unfortunately, it also has a wide range of side effects. New promising antibiotics are mentioned on this slide. Of course, we are waiting for cefidiracol that will be active against the producers of beta-lactamases and avibactam. Now, astrionam could be used together with cefidimrelebactam, but it, this is off-label. That is why a doctor commission needs to decide on that, uh, together with gentamicin, for example. Then inhibitors of uh, beta-lactamases. Um, avibactam is active against most beta-lactamases. Its limits include, first of all, high price, of course, the absence, the absence of action on part of D-class beta-lactamases in participants in particular, oxycelinase uh, and beta lactamase 23. So, avibactam does not allow to efficiently treat infections associated with uh, Acinetobacter baumani. One of the main methods um, of prevention uh, is uh, develop, uh, of developing of uh, hospital infections. Uh, this is control, uh, hand hy hygiene of personnel, and uh, uh, gram negative uh, bacteria uh, uh, don't, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, so they are spread when there are contacts with uh, physicians. Uh, also, um, if there is uh, uh, voluntary ventilation, uh, there should be also cleaning of uh, mouth. And if uh, there are hospital infections, uh, the system of ventilation uh, with the use of uh, filters and also removal uh, of all invasive lines. Uh, for example, um, long term venous uh, catheter, this is also the risk of all hospital infections. And gram negative and gram positive, and also invasive mycosis. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Sergey. Um, I want to say that in the morning, um, the Minister of the Government of Moscow, Alexei Horipun, uh, awarded um, our winners um, competitions, young doctors, uh, and there was uh, no uh, clinical pharmacologist. I hope that next year 
uh, you or your colleagues um, will be awarded um, and we'll see you at the stage, we'll see how you uh, receive awards. Now I would like to give the floor uh, to Tatiana Kamenyeva, Konchalovsky Hospital, clinical pharmacologist. Um, uh, dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I have a short presentation um, and it will be dedicated to SCAT uh, program. Uh, this is uh, one of the tools um, of internal quality control uh, in Moscow. At present, um, in Russia, uh, we uh, define um, quality control. And uh, the last uh, decree from uh, 7th of July about uh, requirements, um, uh, so number uh, 301, so requirements um, regarding organization and conducting of uh, internal quality control and safety of uh, med med medical activity. All medication, all uh, health care centers should control quality in compliance with the requirements. Uh, the, uh, some, so five tasks of internal quality control uh, are defined. Improving um, uh, of medical activity uh, to prevent risks um, uh, for people's lives. Um, uh, development and realization of measures uh, to improve quality of medical help and medical organizations, conditions um, which provide for quality, a provision of rational usage of material technical uh, info information resources, uh, and also uh, state um, and so also a compliance uh, of uh, um, health um, measures. Um, uh, also, we have practical recommendations regarding internal quality control and uh, safety of medical um, organizations, um, uh, uh, hospitals, and also outpatient. In practical recommendations um, uh, on organization of internal quality control, uh, there are approaches uh, to form uh, internal quality control and quality management, safety of medical organization. When we develop uh, recommendations, um, uh, we have a lot of uh, methods, uh, uh, risk management, um, continuous quality, improvement others. In these recommendations, um, we have 11 main directions uh, for quality control. And uh, in each uh, direction, we define indicators, uh, which uh, are already, uh, uh, you know, our goal-oriented indicators and also criteria of uh, evaluation. Besides quality indicators, um, we have also uh, quantitative indicators which can be used uh, uh, to form the system of quality monitoring. On the slide, um, you can see um, all 11 uh, divisions of internal quality control and safety of uh, medical organization. Hospital. Uh, here there are medical, there is the medical safety, pharmaco supervision, but I will speak about epidemiological uh, safety. Epidemiological safety of hospital uh, has microbiological monitoring, uh, and each medical organization. Uh, uh, should uh, conduct it, um, and this is uh, also uh, the requirement of Rothschild nadzor. So then, uh, in microbiological monitoring system, uh, we uh, defined uh, so uh, monitoring uh, micro uh, um, um, pathogens um, which have resistance. Here. 
And besides, in this um, in this requirements, it's defined that we should have decrease um, uh, on uh, conducting rational usage of uh, antibacterial medications of hospitals. In this way, uh, how can we rationally use algorithms of um, antibacterial therapy and also prevention? We have mechanism, the mechanism, this is SCAD program, the strategy of antimicrobial um, therapy control in Moscow. And in this case, we have more than uh, 15 multi-profile um, hospitals. Uh, they conduct this uh, program. We also uh, have internal um, degree, um, empirical um, therapy, um, considering the risks uh, of patients. And here you can see recommendations uh, on SCAT program. And uh, uh, they are signed by chief specialists on uh, uh, clinical pharmacology, uh, anesthesiologist. So then um, this program was updated in 2018. On the slide, uh, Mar Maria already has shown this slide. The main goal of SCAD programs, program, uh, this is prevention of uh, spread uh, uh, of infections resistant to antibiotics, uh, rational application of uh, medications, um, uh, antibacterial um, therapy, optimization of expenses of medical uh, institution uh, on antimicrobial means. Uh, also um, patients um, hospitalized and uh, uh, lessening complications. Uh, SCAT uh, means uh, this is um, rationalization of um, uh, therapy, uh, proper time, proper dosage and uh, duration. Besides, uh, when we implement this um, uh, program, uh, we decline uh, modality, rate of patients, uh, we are, are, are restrain uh, resistance, uh, improve uh, quality of medical um, supervision and also reduction of hospitalization duration. Uh, if we want to uh, fulfill this uh, program, we need a group uh, on uh, control of uh, uh, this um, therapy and also monitoring um, and here we have all documents the main tasks um, uh, of the clinical pharmacologist in this program SCAD program um, and this is consulting on issues of antimicrobial therapy um, creation of passport uh, and uh, uh, also definition of the main um, a list of antimicrobial medications, uh, um, uh, uh, antibiotics prevention uh, organization uh, of clinical economic uh, application of this, uh, also participation uh, in um, organization uh, and, and antimicrobial medications. Um, Usage. This is the stage of or stages of this program realization, and thanks uh, to this program, we uh, can um, uh, we uh, can prescribe antibacterial um, medications. Uh, we developed uh, even soap on the basis of SCAD program. Thanks to this program, we can already prescribe uh, uh, antimicrobial medications, um, um, uh, considering um, uh, types of certification of patients. And besides, um, we always uh, need to conduct a learning process in, uh, in, SCAD, uh, in accordance with SCAD program in the Department of Ministry of Health in Moscow. And the last uh, thing which I wanted to mention, I show, showed you this in the beginning, uh, that we need control uh, uh, over pathogens, resistant pathogens. And at present, uh, thanks uh, to scientific um, management and chief specialist on uh, clinical pharmacology with the support uh, uh, of um, uh, clinical pharmacology department. Uh, uh, this uh, project is already impl being implemented in order uh, for us to understand uh, what uh, 
um, what the spread of um, resistant anti organisms we have, microorganisms we have. Now, Rostov Nadzor developed. Um, uh, uh, clear cut recommendations of quality control and medical safety in safety in the medical organization and also uh, in, in medical organizations uh, we need also to do monitoring of uh, antibiotics resistance we have to implement also monitoring uh, of uh, and the implementation of SCAD program as the main tool uh, on implementation of rational algorithm of uh, antimicrobial therapy now we implement uh, A register of patients um, uh, suffered from infections uh, caused by uh, gram-negative uh, pathogens. And then uh, in the future, we will optimize our approaches uh, to treat these patients. Uh, thank you very much, Tatiana. Uh, you fit the time the schedule very well. Uh, now I would like to give the floor uh, to um, uh, Deputy um, Department uh, of Pharmacology, uh, Elena Kuznetsova. Good afternoon. Uh, it's very pleasant to see you all. Um, my, uh, so I'm also a pharmacist. Uh, um, I can see familiar faces in the audience. Um, I work in the clinical pharmacology. Marina Zhravlyova is my uh, manager, and also I work with uh, Tatiana Kamenyeva. Uh, she is a district uh, pharmacologist of Zelenograd, um, and she improved um, uh, this work um, a lot. Um, and. Um, Maybe I will not um, even uh, uh, show my presentation because I don't have time. That's why I will be brief. Uh, so uh, you spoke about internal quality control and also safety of medical activities. Uh, now I want to say that in our country we have three levels of control, Ostrov Nazor, state control, uh, agency control. Uh, this is the Department of Healthcare system and quality control can be performed um, by any medical organization. But the internal quality control, this is a license um, requirement um, and um, uh, so what, uh, what do I want uh, to uh, take note of? Uh, uh, this uh, quality control is regulated by the federal law, uh, 323. Mm, and now um, uh, we uh, have uh, the decree uh, which says to us how to uh, uh, put this uh, internal quality control. There are 38 uh, of uh, directions. Uh, and Tatiana spoke about epidemiological safety. And this is extremely important uh, also besides epidemiological uh, safety. Uh, so the decree of 806, uh, which was renewed in, uh, in December last year, uh, it's important to conduct um, a research. Um, and um, about uh, undesirable responses in Moscow. Uh, so all, all of which uh, uh, come to our um, um, health care system. Uh, you can see here legal framework uh, documents. Um, I just want to share with you, um, I, I would like to show you the results of my work, uh, our work, our uh, general work, combined work. How can I click? Uh, so a lot. Uh, so speakers already spoke about it. Uh, for all medical organizations, it's important to do internal quality control and pharmaco supervision. Uh, and for us, uh, uh, it's important to pay attention to adverse um, side effects and the responses. Uh, it's important uh, uh, to. Um, speak about uh, them uh, uh, to, uh, to inform uh, um, medical supervision department about this um, and uh, then uh, they should go to database um, 
uh, then uh, they should go to international database. Um, the only thing or validity of these messages um, will be uh, to do this uh, through eyes of um, Rostrafnadzor. On the side um, of Rostrafnadzor, um, there is an instruction, a detailed instruction, and um, we send letters um, every week uh, uh, with the uh, request uh, to get uh, an, uh, a monthly report and also an application how uh, to uh, con connect uh, with Ross as a or also um, we uh, give them our contacts as well. What else uh, can I say? Our system already works. Uh, we collect adverse uh, responses. We have all uh, necessary tools. Um, the decree 381, uh, the decree uh, 836, uh, uh, and uh, on the basis of this uh, decrees, uh, uh, we um, uh, c conduct these activities. We monitor quality of medications and also their usage. Uh, this decree uh, was replaced uh, by uh, another one. Uh, through the efforts of our clinical pharmacologists, uh, we developed standard uh, procedure and the scheme uh, of adverse responses collection. You can see this on this slide. And now um, I would like to present you the results uh, of uh, our work of 2017-2018, uh, the Department of uh, Pharmacology. We conducted uh, our uh, joint um, interviews uh, of all medical organizations. Um, also, we uh, we um, asked for the information um, from chief uh, physicians who is responsible for uh, pharmacological supervision, and. Uh, uh, there should be uh, some people appointed uh, responsible for, uh, for pharmacological supervision. Uh, uh, the decree about collection of adverse events. Uh, and now um, I want to say that, for example, uh, sorry. And um, uh, so. Uh, if we, if we look um, at uh, our um, um, city hospitals, we can see uh, uh, so hospitals um, uh, gave us uh, data um, uh, so um, um, and uh, pediatrics uh, clinics also did not give us an, enough, enough information. Uh, there are no clinical pharmacologists uh, in uh, outpatient. Uh, a network mostly in hospitals uh, and that's why uh, this work is being conducted in hospitals so now uh, our government pays so much attention to um, primary chain uh, clinical pharmacologists uh, and clinical pharmacologists are responsible for the supervision and uh, they should be in all medication organizations and also we hope um, uh, for help of pharmacists um, because also they have knowledge uh, and they can uh, send messages to help people who come to ask for appointment uh, uh, and uh, then they can uh, you know um, uh, transfer this uh, to uh, their physicians uh, and they can, we can consider this so on the slide we can see in blue the clinical pharmacologist responsible for pharmacovigilance. In polyclinics, it is usually the deputy medical director or deputy chief physician. In case of dentistries, these are doctors or pharmacists as well as medical personnel and in specialized medical organizations and scientific centers uh, as well as hospitals these are usually doctors and clinical pharmacologists here i would also like to show you the results of our work we started since the beginning of 2018 and the medical organizations who reported to us uh, on adverse 
events uh, or their lack represented 40 percent. 60 percent of uh, 222 or 228, depending on how to count, did not submit any information about that. Now only three polyclinics did not submit any information, and one, the uh, organization under reorganization. Others do provide us this information thus responding to our monthly messages. Here we can see in, re in gray those who did not submit anything. So we see that uh, in uh, December 2019, almost all the medical organizations have been taking part in the uh, implementation of the order of the Ministry of Healthcare. So here we can see the um, control exercised by the department, but it is always also reported to the other stakeholders. Here we can see some information about adverse reactions. We see more hospitals and polyclinics reporting as well as dentistry clinics uh, that uh, provide us with this information. So one can make uh, a conclusion that adverse events are found everywhere or so if uh, there is no such information that means that perhaps uh, the management of the organization doesn't want to inform about that or there are some other reasons for that this year we have already received 82 reports Analyzing the reports of adverse events, we identified that uh, in case of out-of-patient uh, treatment, there are side uh, effects in 60%. Uh, in case of hospital treatment, uh, there are 30% of them, and uh, the rest are in case of self-treatment. In 2019, data has changed a little bit, but uh, not very significantly. It is related to the fact uh, that uh, our basis, our sample, has increased. Here we considered what are the medicines that trigger adverse events most often. In 2018, we identified uh, 29 adverse reactions to sulfasalazine, then come rifampicin, ceftriaxone, pyrazinamide, Isoniazid, Varfarnirin, Humira, Ampicillin, Levofloxacin, Ciprofloxacin. So antibiotics give us most adverse reactions. Here we see the list of 10 drugs uh, triggering side effects. In yellow here we can see that uh, we had 28 cases of reactions to rifampicin and four reactions already in 2019. So this is a question to Ross Strafnadzor. Maybe uh, this series uh, of rifampicin should not be sold. So in conclusion, one of the main levers to ensure quality and safety of medicines is uh, safety of drugs and pharmacovigilance. Pharmacovigilance uh, should be performed in clinics, polyclinics and pharmacies. It plays a huge role in safety, thus a big role is played by the doctor or who prescribes medicines, nurses, and so on. Pharmacovigilance also aims uh, at preventing side effects. It's important because all the adverse reactions should be recorded, but also all this information should be considered at meetings with the staff to prevent adverse consequences. This is crucial. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Yelena.
you have been so quick that some people did not have time to take pictures, so maybe your presentation can be published on the website of the department. We have completely run out of time, so I am now going to ask uh, Mikhail to excuse me. Yes, colleagues, I'll just say a couple of words. I understand that we have no time left. I've been listening to the presentations of my colleagues and it's been a great pleasure for me to see how interested they are in their profession and how interested you are in their activities. That's really pleasant. Thank you very much, Marina, for having for developing the service of clinical pharmacologists in Moscow. What's important is that we have preserved the system and we continue to develop it. We still have our pharmacies and a lot of clinical pharmacologists. It's very pleasant, but we still have room for improvement. Since uh, it's the end of our discussion of uh, the topic, I'd like to highlight the unprecedented measures taken by Moscow, in particular regarding the patients uh, provided with free medicines. We are expanding the opportunities available. Since 2016, for example, we have been providing persons who fall into those um, uh, reimbursed categories uh, drugs for treating hepatitis C. Starting from 2020, we have switched uh, on uh, interferon-free scheme of treating hepatitis. Starting from the first month 2019, we have uh, introduced uh, an experiment. Uh, when a person came to a doctor to get a medicine, sometimes he was informed that uh, the medicine is not available. Now the doctor can uh, write an experiment statement and uh, in that case, uh, uh, the person would receive uh, money to purchase this drug on market price. So the medical and medicine provision has become closer to people. People like this experiment and uh, the number of complaints reduced by 33%. Starting from 2020, we expand this, expanded this experiment to diabetes and uh, cystic fibrosis. Now patients with those diseases, when they come to the hospital or to the doctor, can also benefit from this experiment and get money. What Sergey has mentioned, Moscow introduced three years earlier new clinical recommendations to treat cancers. I'll say it once again, Moscow identify six most significant diseases that, according to their importance, represent 70% in the overall structure. So to treat those six cancers, 15 billion rubles were allocated. This is unprecedentedly high money. This year we are going to include another four cancers in this list and make a calculation for each type of cancer and ensure full treatment of our patients by contemporary target immune medicines. Regarding some other measures that were taken, we have launched a program and now people affected with heart diseases who are not entitled to free medicines are going to be provided with uh, new modern medicines and thus it will reduce the mortality of our citizens. And last but not least, digitalization. Our system of uh, free medicine provision in hospital is so transparent and allows to see every step. And I hope indeed that overall the measures taken and your professionalism will allow to achieve huge success. Thank you, colleagues. I thank everyone present here today, wish you a nice evening, and hope that our session was interesting and useful.